You mentioned the uh, Maya writing system. What are some interesting aspects of their language that they've used and the written language that they used? Well, you know, one of the things that confound me as a guy who's spent you know, a better portion of my life studying it. I had the honor of being uh, the student of uh, Linda Sheely right here at the University of Texas at Austin. She got the group together who broke the Maya Code of Hieroglyphics in the nice. 1970s. So nice. I learned from the best and, and loved every minute of it. I miss Linda. Can you speak to that code, actually, the hieroglyphic code and what it takes to break it? Oh, boy. I mean, what a what a thing. We, we had kind of a, a Rosetta Stone. We had a page out of Diego de Landa's book, a priest who was converting the Maya in Yucatan, asked his informants about their writing system and what every sound meant. And he was convinced they had an alphabet like we do. So he got this Maya guy, sat down in Spanish, and he said, okay, you're going to write all the symbols right here in my book. Write, write an A ah here, write a B here, write a C here. And that guy just wrote all of the sounds that the priest told him to write. Mm -hmm. They were actually syllables. They were vowel, consonant combinations. They weren't an alphabet. But that turned into our Rosetta Stone of sorts. The big key is that the Maya still speak that same language. There are millions of Maya people who are speaking a version of Maya. Now, there's, there's where I get confused that we've got a single writing system that is uh, intelligible. We've broken the code, so we know that it's basically the same writing system from the top of the Yucatan into Guatemala and El Salvador. But we have 33 Maya languages today that are mutually unintelligible. And we, we backwards project the language uh, of what they spoke back then that the glyphs are in to something called chol T, which is a combination of chor T and Chol, two of those languages. But it doesn't work for me at all. How did, if there was one language, maybe two back then, how did it flower into 33 mutually unintelligible languages in just 500 years during uh, culture acculturation, and horrible infectious diseases that killed 90% of the population. How did that happen? So we're missing something huge here. I think it's more like Chinese, where Chinese letters, uh, uh, writing can be read in multiple languages and still understood. I don't know exactly the mechanics of how that would happen, but it just seems impossible that there are more languages, not less languages in the Maya area after the last 500 years that they've been through. So you think that there's some kind of process of either rapidly generating dialects or there's always has been these dialects, or I should say they're distinct languages, even though there's a common writing system. There, there must have been a way that multiple languages understood the same writing system. Or maybe there was something like, like Latin, you know how there was a period in Europe where, like, most people were illiterate, and there was this this priesthood who all understood Latin and they wrote in Latin. Yeah, maybe, maybe the the hieroglyphs represent a kind of Latin in the ancient Maya world. But we don't really know, and there's not clear evidence to fill in the gaps of how it's possible to have that. Right. But we did realize it was actually a Russian scholar named Yuri Konorozov who broke the code. The Americans and the Europeans were absolutely sure that the language was, uh, that the written language was a dead language. But Yuri, not knowing any of that, not being filled with all of those thoughts from America and, and Europe, went about it in the way that he was taught. Uh, in his in his grad school in Moscow, and just went to the dictionaries, and he looked at Yucatec language that they're speaking today, and he applied it to the symbol system, and he knew that there were certain sounds. He used Landa's alphabet, and he found there was the his two key examples were a, a picture of a dog with a symbol over it, and a picture of a turkey with a symbol over it, and the dog. Uh, a dog in Yucatec is tsul. So he saw two symbols and he said, this one's probably tsul 
and this one's ul, and then the, the turkey was kuts, so it would be ku ending in tsu. And he showed how, look, you know, this is suits, this is tsul, those two things that, that should be tsu are the same symbol. And that began this process of unraveling the syllables that we're still working on today. That's fascinating. Just that decoding process is fascinating. Like, how do you even figure that out? And there's probably still, is there still, are you aware of any um, written languages that haven't been decoded yet? Yeah. Yeah, there's a number of them. There's uh, Easter Island script. I was just talking to, uh, we've apparently made a few advances there now. It's called Rongo Rongo. And we only have about maybe 25 examples of texts. But we're beginning to break that. There's also a, the the big one is Harappan. Harappan, for a long time, we used to say there were there were five independent scripts on the planet. Mm -hmm. And those were Chinese, Cuneiform, which is Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Maya, and then Harappan, which is from northern India. That's the only one that we've never cracked. And now all the epigraphers, the people, that's the term for epigraphy is uh, translating these languages. They're all ganging up on Harappan and want to kick it off the list because we can't break it. It had a, a big enough symbol set, but no one's been able to crack it. And now they're saying it's just an elaborate symbol set and doesn't reflect the the spoken word. That's a, that's a, that's a hypothesis, but it's, which is what would explain why it's so difficult right. to break. I, but, you know, we could just be faced with a quitter generation. Maybe somebody will pick up the baton next generation. Kids these and, days and, <laughs> with their... <laughs> the other one that fascinates me is from the Americas. It's the quipu. The, the Inca had the quipu, this knotted string records, but it was definitely encoding more than just math. We know the math. I know lots. Of, I, I can do the math quipus and figure out what they're totaling and things. Yeah, there's a yeah. kipu right kipu there. Kipu are recording devices fashioned from strings historically used by a number of cultures in the region of India and South America. A kipu usually consists of cotton or camel or fiber strings. So there's a set of strings and they're supposed to what? To be saying something? There, there's one long string that the little ones dangle off of and each one of the, the dangling strings have sets of knots on them. And the knots... Some of them are mathematical kipus, and those, we can just do the math. We can prove that it's math. Mm -hmm. um, they also encoded language in there. They had entire libraries in Cusco where Spanish conquistadors were brought through, and the caretakers of the libraries would just put, they'd say, uh, pull that one down, read that one to me. And he'd pull it out and just read a history of something that happened 200 years earlier. So it was definitely writing but in the 1570s, one, uh, one head of the church there had all of the people that could read them called kipu kamayaks mm -hmm. gathered up, had them read all of their kipus and transcribe them into Spanish books, and then had the kipus burned and those people murdered. Okay. Well, there you go. And so we can't break the code still today, but we know... <laughs> it was absolutely a written language. Though it wasn't written, it was weaved or knotted. And there's still some kipus available that could be... Uh... There's, I think now we've just crossed the 1,000 mark. Mm. So we have 1,000 kipus. There's enough to break the code. Um, and, I, and I think this generation might be the one that does it. It's sad that so few are, have survived... Yeah. I mean, a thousand is good, but it's. But see, there's. Peru has barely scratched the surface with archaeology. There's so much out there. There's There was a priest I read about named uh, Diego de Porres, who was one of the early people in Peru converting communities. And his chronicle is real clear that he wanted to teach this community of 3,000 people all the Spanish prayers, the important ones for them to be converted into Christianity. And he had the, the communities, Kipu Kamayaks, not Kipus for each person that told them that they could read them out and memorize the prayers. And if they were caught without their Kipu in town, they were flogged. So he had 3,000 of the same Kipu made and handed out to this community. If we find that community and find its cemetery, 
there is a Rosetta Stone. You know, it is probably the case that there is somebody in Peru and maybe a large community that knows this language, that understands and like you just have to show up and ask them. And it's it's like they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They <laughs> there there are some communities that are using them. There's a couple of them that we had high hopes for, and then it was apparent that they were just making shit up. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they didn't actually know how to read it. They just knew it used to be read. So they like made a bunch of stuff about what it says and they yeah. bring it out and they act like they can read it, but then <laughs> when you ask them the details, they don't know. Yeah. But then on a much simpler level, there's uh llama herders who keep a string in their pocket and they've they've got uh the knots equaling how many llamas they have and then they have subcategories of information like this one's sick the uh, we've lost these ones this one's pregnant so they have these more simple and more mathematical kipus but they're using them to affect as a as a record 